Yeah, I'm going to talk about nuclear accidents. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, well, probably too long, studying the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 1986, which is, I'm sure that's before most of you were born, but your teachers will uh, remember, or probably even the, some of the teachers now don't remember the Chernobyl accident. But anyway, I've spent my whole career basically studying it. Uh, there's the Chernobyl reactor there. Um, the worst nuclear accident in history. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about the Chernobyl accident and the effects on human health and environmental health and discuss the question whether we need nuclear power. And along the way I'll mention Fukushima as well. I have to start by picking out three people from the audience. And I thought of funny statistical physics ways of doing it, but then I thought I'd just chuck tennis balls into the audience. Nothing, don't worry, if you catch it, nothing bad will happen. You just have to hold on to it for, the, for, um, for part of the lecture. <laughs> There we go. Is the, uh, is the applause for me or for the people who caught the tennis balls? I, I don't know. Uh, right. Um, we're talking a lot about nuclear power because Britain wants to build 10, 10 if we can afford it, or if the companies that want to build them can afford them. Uh, they want to build 10 new nuclear power stations. And it's a big debate at the moment because of the potential environmental health effects, the, accident, the, the big cost of nuclear power. Back in, this is an advert from the 1960s when Britain's first nuclear power stations were being built and the, the idea then, that says flick by the way there, that doesn't say what you might think it says. Um, yeah. Uh, so everybody, everybody thought in the 1960s, 1970s, everybody thought that that nuclear was going to be the great, the great white hope of technology. We were going to, the, the, the phrase was that, that it would produce electricity that was too cheap to meter. It was going to be so cheap, nuclear, the power of the atom, going to produce electricity that was so cheap, we wouldn't even need to have electricity in our houses because it would be more expensive to, to count how much we'd used than to produce it. Because it didn't work out that way, and it didn't work out that way for various economic reasons. Um, but also because there have been some quite high profile accidents at nuclear power stations. Um, I, I won't go through these in detail, but we, we had the first nuclear accident at Windscale, which is up in the northwest. They now call it Sellafield. It was so bad they had to change the name. Um, it was at a plutonium production uh, plant, uh, which was producing. Uh, material for our nuclear weapons program. The first two of these accidents, one in Kishtim in Russia, were both associated with the, the Cold War uh, development, the production of plutonium, tritium for, uh, for the nuclear power program, the nuclear weapons program in, in the UK and Russia. Three Mile Island was the first serious accident at a civilian nuclear power station and it caused a, it was a partial meltdown of the reactor core. I won't, won't go into the reasons because I'd be here all day. Um, but no radioactivity escaped from the, from the containment, no, no significant radioactivity escaped from Three Mile Island into the environment. But it was the first kind of warning that this stuff could be dangerous. There was a certain complacency at the time that nuclear power was dead safe and the, 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 the risk of accidents was so small it wasn't worth worth worrying about. Then of course we had the Chernobyl accident in Ukraine in 1986 and I started working in about 1990 on my PhD studying the effects of Chernobyl radioactivity up in the Lake District in the northwest of England. So a very far-reaching uh, accident. And then of course there was Fukushima uh, in 2011. There we go, that's Chernobyl. So here's the Chernobyl reactor. It was an explosion of steam. It was an explosion of steam because the, react, the nuclear reactor, for various reasons, it went out of control, superheated the steam within the reactor core, and the, the explosion was sufficient. There's a 2,000 ton concrete lid on top of the reactor core. The, the uh, explosion was sufficiently powerful to blow that concrete lid off the reactor, destroy the reactor building, and send radioactivity uh, throughout quite a large part of Europe. There we go, in case your geography isn't too good, 
Uh, there's, there's Chernobyl, this is Ukraine, Belarus and Russia all the way down here. Uh, Chernobyl was on the border of Ukraine and Belarus and quite a lot of the radioactivity went to the north into this small country, the last dictatorship in Europe. Um, uh, about two thirds of the radioactivity went north into Belarus, though the Chernobyl reactor itself is in Ukraine. We can see here, this is Kiev, whoops, the capital city of Ukraine, uh, and there's just, just here you can see a reservoir system. There's a river here and a whole load of reservoirs going down to the Black Sea. And that river rev reservoir system, the Dnipro Pripyat reservoir system, provided drinking water, irrigation, uh, fishing for a population of about 15 million people. So when I started working on Chernobyl, there was a lot of uh, concern about the contamination of this aquatic system, and that's what we started doing a lot of work on. That's the pattern of fallout, and if you followed the Fukushima accident at all, in, in the first few weeks all the, all the uh, newspapers and TV were talking about iodine-131, which is a very short-lived radionuclide. It's only around in the environment for a first... It's got a half-life of... I don't need to explain what a half-life is, because you're all physicists. Aren't you? It's got a half-life of about eight days, so it's not around for very long, but in that period it can have very significant uh, radiotoxic effects. The one we're talking about at the moment, at Fukushima and still at Chernobyl, is cesium-137, because that has a 30-year half-life, so still more than half of the, Ch of the Chernobyl radio cesium is remaining in the environment. And we can see the pattern of contamination. There's a patch around the, the power station here, about like, we call it a 30-kilometer zone, where 150,000 people were evacuated because of this high contamination from radioactivity directly from the explosion. There's another area here that we've worked in, which is to the northeast, and it just happened that um, as the cloud of radioactive gases passed to the northeast, northeast, there was a rainfall, and the rainfall washed the radioactivity out of the air and onto a great patch of contamination around here in, in the eastern part of Belarus and the western part of, of Russia. This is the map of cesium in Europe, um, and we can see these are the two blobs of contamination we just saw. The contamination went north up into Scandinavia, parts of Austria, southern Germany, and we even, you can just see it here, on the northwest, we got some contamination. And that was again where it happened to, well, it rains a lot in the northwest, north Wales, uh, southern, uh, southwestern part of Scotland. It washed out the radioactivity onto the land, and last year they, they stopped sheep restrictions in the Lake District from Chernobyl radioactive contamination. So a very far-reaching accident and a very long-lived one. This is a picture of Pripyat, which is the town that was built to house the workers at Chernobyl. I don't know if you can just see it in the background. Dimly in the background, that's the, what we call the sarcophagus, which is the building that was, was put over the reactor to contain the, the radioactivity. And the reactor core is still in there. Um, so this city is very, you know, three, four kilometers from the Chernobyl power station itself. That's evacuated, and if you go there now and stand on one of the buildings, you see about you sort of a science fiction type scene of trees growing in the middle of the roads. You go to the sports field in Pripyat, and there's a little forest in the middle of the sports field. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later. Nature is beginning to take over um, the contaminated areas. Understandably, the media reporting of the accident, like at Fukushima, was there was talk of apocalypse and um, nuclear meltdown, very dramatic headlines, quite understandably. I looked through some of the headlines just to remind us what it was like. Uh, we had very dramatic pictures of the damaged reactor with deadly toll of Chernobyl, and, and these dramatic pictures of people in radiation suits going around measuring things with, with Geiger counters. Uh, cancer danger from isotopes, and some terrible pictures of the people who survived uh, the accident, at least the people who were working in the first few days uh, to clean up the accident. There were helicopter pilots sent in uh, who had to hover over the destroyed reactor and drop sand, boron, lead onto the reactor core to put out the reactor fire, and they were exposed to a whole nuclear reactor's worth of radiation. 
Uh, there were about 134 of those people got radiation sickness from the intense uh, radioactivity there, and approximately 40 of those died. Some very dramatic pictures. Another thing we've seen since Chernobyl is very dramatic pictures of children with cancer. And this is a, an issue I want to talk about because um, even now, every anniversary of Chernobyl, the 20th anniversary, the 25th, a BBC reporter goes to a hospital in Ukraine and finds a child with cancer and says, this is because of Chernobyl. And we, this is, I want to kind of highlight a bit how the difference between physics and, and, and the media, there are, there are differences. And, you know, we try to, in physics to look at things statistically and use the kind of sometimes dull and sometimes kind of soulless statistics. The media, understandably, like to focus on individual cases, so individual people, because that's what we like reading about. So the, the, I, want to, I want to kind of draw this, this distinction between how the media approaches a subject and how, how physicists and scientists approach a subject. On a slightly lighter note, we, we saw headlines like Austrians told not to panic. Now if I was an Austrian and I woke up in the morning, over breakfast opened my newspaper and it said don't panic, the f my, my first reaction would be, why are they telling me not to panic? There must be something wrong. And this, it's kind of, the, the Japanese were criticised a lot for their handling of Fukushima, but I had a lot of sympathy for them because it's an extraordinarily difficult thing to manage um, the information in the context of a major nuclear accident because whatever you say is going to be taken as... Um, with, with mistrust because of the situation that the people in, because of the fear surrounding radiation. And the media naturally focus on the worst case scenario. So I've seen estimates for the, the death toll from the Chernobyl accident, which range from 42, which is significant, but not a major, major accident, up to, well, actually 500,000 I've seen estimates. And of course, if I'm a reporter and I go with my story to the editor and say only 42 people died from Chernobyl, it doesn't really hit the headlines. Um, the media naturally go for the worst case scenario, paint the worst picture, whereas hopefully sign, scientists try and, um, try, and, try and get to the facts, even though, as in the case of Chernobyl, it takes about 20 years for us to get there. And we still don't know at the end because we still say there are uncertainties. So I want to try and understand what the radiation risk from Chernobyl was and um, so that we can get this terrible accident into context. How do we know radiation is bad for us? I mean, it wasn't always known that it was bad for us. Um, in the 1920s, uh, when Marie Curie had just discovered radium, um, people used to take radium baths. And I've got a great picture of a, some radium bath salts where people would, the, the instructions on them say, you put these salts in your bath, you get in your bath, you cover the bath over so you inhale the maximum amount of radioactive radon gas, you sit in your bath for 40 minutes, and then you go and lie down, presumably to recover from the radiation sickness you've got from your, your bath. Um, uh, people thought initially that radiation was good for you, and in some respects it is, because we use it all the time in hospitals to cure cancer, um, to do diagnostic tests and so on. So it's not a, a clear picture, but we now know that radiation does pose a risk to our health. And we mainly know that because people have studied the people who survived the terrible Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings. And in 1950, the, there was an institute set up in Japan called the Radiation Effects Research Foundation. And the whole job of this institute was to study the people who'd survived the terrible atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what they did, they put them into groups, we call them cohorts, and they studied about 90,000 people, put them into groups, and they reconstructed for each of those people the radiation dose that they received from the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they put them in groups, and they followed their health for the rest of their lives. And this study is still going on, because there are still a few survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki alive today. So each five years, they update with their results, and they look at how many cancers there were, how many people died of heart attacks. They looked at the next generation, the children of those survivors, to see if they could see any health effects on that next generation. 
What did they find? Well, this is the main thing that they found. This is a plot of the um, cancer deaths per 10,000 people um, in that group. And it's a plot against the radiation dose rate that they got in millisieverts. Now, you probably aren't familiar with that unit. Um, it's, a, it's a measure of radiation risk. So when I go to work at Chernobyl, I get a little badge, and when I get back, I send it off, and somebody sends me back a, a piece of paper which says, you got 0.1 millisieverts of radiation when you were at Chernobyl. And if I want to, and I'm feeling a bit morbid, I can calculate what my chances of getting cancer in later life are from that radiation risk. And, and it's always, it was always low, otherwise I wouldn't keep going there. Um, so a, a, sieve, a millisievert, a thousandth of a sievert, is a measure of your radiation risk. What does this graph say? Well, it says that radiation is bad for us. Um, so this is the number of cancer deaths per 10,000 people. I'm going to point to it because I think she's gone. Number of cancer deaths per 10,000 people as the radiation dose rate goes up. And we see a straight line relationship. So the more radiation, the more your risk of getting cancer in later life. This dotted line is a normal cancer incidence. About a quarter to a third of people die of cancer in, in most developed countries. So what does it say? It says there is an increased risk of getting cancer at radiation, um, at, at significant radiation dose rates. The difficulty with this graph is that most of the radiation dose rates around here. So most people are not exposed, to, fortunately, to atomic bomb type radiation. So most of us, even when I go to Chernobyl, I get dose rates down here. It's very difficult statistically to see a difference between that and the normal cancer incidence. But we know from this graph and we can estimate what our cancer risk is. And we know from Chernobyl that there were significant cancer effects. We know um, that 40 people died after the Chernobyl accident. The helicopter pilots, the firemen, the people that got very intense radiation died from acute radiation sickness. In Belarus and Ukraine, children who um, were exposed to iodine-131, this very short-lived but very radiotoxic radionuclide, well, there were more than 4,000 cases of thyroid cancer and 15 of those have died. This is the plot of thyroid cancer in Belarus up to 2002. And we can see that in the year of Chernobyl, there was fewer than one case in 100,000. But this rose, and is still going on, to about six, seven, eight cases per 100,000. So a significant increase in thyroid cancer. And the reason for that was that the Soviet Union didn't stop children from drinking milk eating leafy vegetables. In the news after Fukushima, you might remember that there was a big effort in Japan to stop people from eating contaminated products in those first few weeks after the accident. The Soviet Union didn't do that, and that has led to this big increase in thyroid cancer. Fortunately, thyroid cancer is a very treatable cancer. In 99% of cases, it can be successfully treated, ironically, by iodine-131 therapy. So we have seen health effects from Chernobyl. The other health effects that we might see, the other cancers, the breast cancer, cancer of the brain, uh, lung cancer, uh, we're just not going to see those cases because we can't statistically tell the difference between the small additional risk that people had from Chernobyl compared to the natural incidence of cancer of between a quarter and a third of people dying of cancer. So, so far there's no clear evidence of increases in leukaemia, although we would expect to see uh, an increase. We can make an estimate, based on what we know from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, of about 8,000 additional future cancers in the most affected populations. So that's the people, in, who, people who were evacuated, the people living in the areas around Chernobyl. Why will we never see it? We'll probably never see it because the number of natural cancers in that population is 470,000. So that's what we would expect 
people to get in that population of about two to three million people. So we're not going to see an increase, or it's going to be very, very difficult to see an increase of 8,000 against that background of about half a million. If we try and make an estimate, and we're using models and our hypothetical knowledge, we try and make an estimate for the world population. So that means we add up all the radiation doses that people got in the UK, in Germany, in Japan, from Chernobyl. And if we add up all those tiny doses and then calculate for the enormous population, then we can estimate about 30,000 early deaths. From so very significant. We have to try and put that risk into context though. In the UK, people got about an additional 0.1 millisievert of radiation from Chernobyl. On average in the UK, everybody gets about 2.2 millisieverts of radiation from cosmic rays, from the radioact natural radioactivity in building materials, in roads, in houses. So in the UK, we could estimate that 50 or 60 people would die of cancer from Chernobyl amongst a massive number of tens of thousands who would die from other forms of radioactivity in the environment. Natural radiation, when you go on an aeroplane you get an extra radiation dose. So we're talking about an additional risk but a relatively small additional risk to the individual. I want to think about, I want to try and put this in context by thinking about what would happen if a terrorist exploded a, a dirty bomb, a, a you, a cesium contaminated bomb in London and we all in this room got a radiation dose of 100 millisieverts which is a typical sort of radiation dose you might get from a from a dirty bomb exposure and to put that in context the, the people the workers at Fukushima who stayed around they call them the Fukushima 50 who stayed around to try and get the reactor under control uh, they got about 250 millisieverts of radiation. So it's quite a big radiation dose. So if we all in this room got 100 millisieverts of radiation, what would we die of? I know it's a bit, it's a bit morbid. It's a bit morbid, but I'm try, we, we, we try to understand risk. And so we have to. And you probably don't think about it, but when you get in your 40s like I am, you start thinking, oh, God, what am I going to die of? I can see some of the teachers are smiling, <laughs> smiling, smiling nervously. Well, what are we going to... Um, so I, I want to start. Um, can all the smokers in the room please stand up? Come on, be honest. Any sm I, I, that's just amazing. <laughs> well, I'm very happy to see... I'm very happy to see... There are, there are no smokers in this room. That's, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Um, <laughs> In, in, any, um, in, in, an average, in an average group of 16 to 19 year olds, about 20% of people smoke. So we'll just imagine that you're, you're an average group of 16 to 19 year olds. So can sort of this, this section of the audience, can you all stand up please? Pret just pretend you're the smokers. Right, um, actually, half of you can sit down again because you've died of a... Oh, that, that's it, about that lot. You've died of a smoking-related illness. Half of people die of smoking. So that's the smokers out the way. Um, what, are the, what are the rest of us going to die of? Um, well, can this... You're the cardiovascular disease, people. You lot all stand up. You lot all stand up. 40% diseases of the heart, of the lungs, and so on. Cancers, um, about this lot, you lot stand up. 23, in the UK, 23% of people die of cancer. Respiratory diseases, a few people at the front, your respiratory diseases, you stand up. Accidents. Well, we'll have the smokers here. You can stand up from the accident. Various other causes. The rest of everybody else stand up. Okay. And now that, every, now that everybody's awake, we can see these. This, so we've all had, we've all had 
100 millisieverts of radiation. We've all been exposed to half the radiation dose that the Fukushima 50 got. Um, how many people are going to die of that? Well, obviously, it's the people with the tennis balls. Who got the tennis ball? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you can all sit down now. Uh, who had the tennis balls? Uh, <laughs> I'll keep that. Who else had a tennis ball? There you go. Pass that along. I don't know if that helped, but I think the, the basic point is that we shouldn't, we, we, we tend to worry quite a lot, especially when it's radiation, we're, so we're scared of radiation. We worry about radiation quite a lot because it's something that we, you know, we, we can't see, we don't know the risks, it's associated with nuclear accidents and so on. Really, we should be worrying about the other things in our lives, especially the smokers. A friend of mine is a, and I'm not particularly anti-smoking, if people want to smoke they can, but a friend of mine in the Ukraine is a Chernobyl liquidator and he's one of the people who went in in the first months after the accident to, to do science in the exclusion zone. So he's officially a Chernobyl emergency worker and he gets a little card which gives him free bus and tube travel in, in Kiev and that's about it uh, as compensation. Uh, so anyway, he was smoking a few years ago and I said, well, you know, it's not very good for you. Uh, why do you smoke? And he said, oh, well, I'm a Chernobyl liquidator. I'm going to die of cancer anyway. And well, <laughs> he did actually say that. Uh, well, what's the risk? He has got an enhanced risk, and it's not insignificant. But if he keeps smoking, he's given up now, actually. But his risk is 50-50. So, you know, the things that we do in our lives very often, our diet, our, you know, our behavior, smoking, our risk-taking behavior, um, can have a much bigger impact on our health than some of the things we hear about in the newspapers like, I don't know, free radicals and eating broccoli and stuff like that that we're always on about. Okay, I'm I've talked a bit about health effects. I want to talk about the ecological effects. So, what's it, what's it like? What's, what's Chernobyl done to the ecology of the area? Oh, there, does Blinky <laughs> live near? It? I don't know if people remember an episode of The Simpsons where... Bart Simpson catches a three-eyed fish from the cooling pond of his local nuclear power station. Uh, we've spent a lot of time studying the aquatic systems at, at Chernobyl, so my question is, does, does Blinky live near Chernobyl? We know that in the immediate aftermath of the accident, there were very severe effects on, on, a, on a small area of forest, about four square kilometres of forest, near the power station. This is called the Red Forest. And if you go there, your Geiger counter just about goes off the, off the scale. And in the first days and weeks after the accident, this area of forest got very, very high doses of radiation. And the, many of the trees there died, and the trees were chopped down and buried, and there's now a new forest growing in its place. Um, so a very severe ecosystem effects. Understandably, at the time, people were more concerned about getting the people out than studying the animals in the area. Um, but some Ukrainian scientists took some, some cattle who'd been left in the exclusion zone, and some of them died because of the intense radioactive iodine damage to the thyroid in this very contaminated area. And the, 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 the ones that had survived, they took out of the exclusion zone and they bred them to see if they had, presumably, to see if they had two heads, or the next generation had two heads or, or five legs. The, the report of this I saw said the second generation were normal, which presumably means they had the right number of heads and legs and so on. Um, th there were a lot of stories after the accident, of, and the, the same is true of Fukushima, a lot of stories of mutant animals. Um, it's possible, it's possible that there were, um, but probably quite unlikely. Um, but we, we know that there were severe impacts on the ecosystem from this very intense radiation during the first days and weeks after the accident. What happened in the longer term? Well, we've been studying lakes at Chernobyl. So this is, uh, this is the, the 30 kilometer zone. This is a lake called Globoki Lake, which is probably the most contaminated uh, lake in the world, or at least it was until the Fukushima accident. So we studied lakes at different levels of contamination 
from near to background radiation up to this very, very contaminated lake. We even looked at the cooling pond. So this is a reservoir, 22 square kilometres. There's the Chernobyl plant itself. Uh, the village of the town of Pripyat is just there to the, um, to the northwest. Uh, so we looked at the, the cooling pond, you know, what's growing in the, in the Chernobyl cooling pond. And we looked at the biodiversity of aquatic invertebrates. I shouldn't call it, my biologist colleagues tell me I shouldn't call them in insects, I should call them invertebrates, but the little creepy crawly things that live in the, in the very contaminated sediments of these lakes. And we studied the things that we expect, or biologists expect, to be related to the biodiversity of insects in lakes, things like the size of the lake, the, the conductivity, the pH, the phosphate. And we also looked at the, the load of radioactive cesium, the radiation dose that these insects were getting. This is us standing, this is me trying to pretend I know what I'm doing. I didn't do the, the, the nitty gritty bit of this, which was identifying all the insects, studying them. Uh, my biologist colleagues did that. So we collected lots of insects from lots of different lakes to try and see if we could see an effect of the radiation on the aquatic ecosystem. And we couldn't. This is a measure of the species richness. So the number of species in these different lakes, and this is increasing radioactive contamination. And what did we see? No significant relationship between the radiation and the diversity or abundance of, it, of aquatic invertebrates. Indeed, our most contaminated lake, Globoki Lake, had the most diversity of aquatic insects. We looked at fish. This again is the number of species of fish, and this is increasing radio radioactive contamination of different lakes. What do we see? No correlation. What we see is what biologists always see, which is that in big aquatic ecosystems, like the Kiev Reservoir, you've got lots of habitats, lots of fish diversity. Big aquatic ecosystems, like the cooling pond, which had, at least until the year 2000, it had the additional advantage of nice warm water coming in um, from the power station, a very high diversity of fish species, and three uh, red, red data book rare species. So no impact, as far as we could see, of radiation on the aquatic ecosystem. What happens if we look more in detail, and there have been a lot of studies since the Chernobyl accident about the symmetry of organisms. Is there some um, effect of the development of organisms of the radiation? Some studies say yes, some studies say no. There's some evidence of increased mutation rates of certain genes in the, in the animals. But there's no evidence of serious effects on the physiology, on the reproductive capability of different organisms. What the Ukrainian and Belarusian scientists who work in the exclusion zone have found is that after the accident there was a dramatic decrease in animals associated with humans, pigeons, rats, sparrows, animals that like to live where humans live, a dramatic increase in the biodiversity and abundance of wild species. So now in the exclusion zone there are 200 species of birds, 55 species of manimal, mammals including wolves. Uh, the Belarusians have reintroduced the rare European bison into their sector of the exclusion zone and the population is doing very well. Uh, eight species of reptiles, amphibians, lots of fish species. It doesn't say that radiation is good for animals, it just says that human habitation of an ecosystem is much, much worse than the biggest nuclear accident in history. What we do to ecosystems, hunting, fishing, chopping down trees, agriculture, does much more harm to an ecosystem than even a very serious uh, nuclear accident. So when the people were moved out of this area, there was a big increase in the abundance and diversity of wild species. I want to talk a bit about Fukushima, um, uh, because I can't not. And I have to say that I, yeah, I spent 20 years studying Chernobyl, <coughs> and the whole point of my research was that, that we would better be able to predict the consequences of another nuclear accident 
But really, in my heart of hearts, I never believed we'd have another nuclear accident. And Fukushima has shaken my faith in nuclear power and in the kind of ability of organisations to see the big obvious thing that um, they've been ignoring this whole time. And the big obvious thing, with hindsight, uh, at Fukushima is that they didn't plan for the thousand, one in a thousand earthquake and tsunami. And we probably know the history, but the, there was a magnitude nine earthquake, a one in a thousand year event. There was a tsunami of height 10 meters at Fukushima, and the seawall at Fukushima was only six meters. So the, uh, the, in response to the earthquake, the nuclear power station shut down as it should do. It was automatic shutdown of all the reactors. Um, but what they didn't reckon on was the tsunami overwhelming the sea defences and destroying the backup diesel generators. And nuclear power stations, they need continual cooling even after they've been shut down. And if you don't do that cooling, we get the terrible consequences you see here of the explosion. Not within the reactor, it wasn't an explosion within the reactor, it was an explosion of hydrogen gas that came from the, super, the, 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 the heating of the reactor core itself. So with hindsight, it was an, an obvious accident. Um, and indeed, there were several reports prior to Fukushima which said that this sort of plant in, in this area of high earthquake frequency uh, is at risk and that the sea walls, the sea defences or the, the backup safety systems should have been designed with this one in a thousand year earthquake in mind. The, the, the knowledge was there, there just wasn't the willingness or the kind of corporate uh, ability to take on that knowledge and do something about it until too late, which is very often the case with human endeavours. So what did the, the earthquake, did 15,000 deaths, more than 15,000 deaths, more than 125,000 buildings damaged or destroyed. The actual consequence of the earthquake and tsunami were enormous. I want to try and put the, the radioactive contamination from Fukushima in context. This is our Chernobyl map and if you want to try and compare, this is, this is the Fukushima map on the same scale as the Chernobyl map. So if you want to compare then that yellow area of contamination, again it's radioactive cesium contamination, you compare it with these dark bits here these dark spots here. And it, if you add it all up, it comes to about a fifth of the area contaminated. So the Fukushima wasn't as significant as Chernobyl in terms of area of land contaminated, about a fifth of the area. But in terms of the levels of contamination, some areas greater than three megabecquerels per square meter, which is pretty hot. Um, in terms of the level of contamination, um, just as significant as Chernobyl. And these areas are still evacuated uh, to this day. I was, well, in, I'm in Portsmouth, so I was trying to put this in, in Portsmouth context. It's, it's a significant area of land. This is, so this, if, if the Fukushima had happened in Portsmouth, and uh, the wind was blowing over at Chichester, it would kind of, this would be that area of really high contamination where people were evacuated. So in terms of UK, it's not a massive area, same is true of Japan, but it is a very significant area and a very large amount of contaminated land. In Fukushima, about 80,000 people have still not returned to their homes. I was asked to do an opinion um, in just two weeks after Fukushima. It was published in early April 2011 about what would happen based on our experience of Chernobyl. And I said then, um, and I think it's still true, that there'll be long-term evacuation and long-term, that means decades of contamination of foodstuffs in many of the contaminated areas. And it's an interesting question, what's gonna happen to that land? Is it gonna be like Chernobyl? And I believe it will be, if, if the Japanese leave it, in other words, they don't try and do the massive clean-up job that they've promised to do. It's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous job to try and clean up that sort of area, 400 square kilometers of land. If they leave it, then it, 
will probably become a nature reserve. Another issue which I've tried to allude to is the social and psychological impacts of nuclear accidents. And because of this fear that we have of radiation, the, the, the impacts of a nuclear accident are possibly worse in terms of their mental health, economic and social impacts than the direct impacts of radiation. I was involved in the UN Chernobyl Forum report and I was involved in the environment part of that report. The, the health section of the report, the main conclusion, the mental health impact of Chernobyl is the largest public health problem unleashed by the accident to date. And I, I believe that's true. Because radiation holds such fear for people, because the, it's very difficult to get across information about radiation, what in people's individual risk is, the, the fear, the, the dislocation of people from their homes, their inability to return to their homes, causes enormous social and psychological impacts in itself. And already, this is a, a recent um, Nature editorial, uh, fall out of fear. They're already, after Fukushima, they're seeing uh, mental health, social impacts on the evacuation. I want to um, put up a picture. I often put this guy on my, uh, on my lectures. He's called Grigory Mamanin. Um, we were doing a lot of work on a contaminated lake in Belarus. And it was an evacuated area. And we were studying the, the fish to see how contaminated they were, to see if there were any radiation effects on the fish. He was there with his fishing rod, catching the fish for his tea. Uh, and he, he'd refused to move from the evacuated area. He said, I'm not going to move from my house. I'm going to live the way I want to live. He was growing all his own vegetables in the contaminated soil. He took his water from a well. He got quite, I have to say he's dead now. Um, but, but he lived, he lived to 75. <laughs> which in Belarus, this was in the 1990s, in Belarus at the time, life expectancy in men was down to 60. Not because of radiation, but because of alcoholism, smoking, poor diet, unemployment. All these factors have a much bigger impact. And I think, we thought he was mad, but thinking more about it, I think he made the right decision. A lot of this, a lot of risk is about how we perceive it, whether we think it's going to bother us, or whether we're just going to get on with our lives and not worry about it. I'm just going to finish for five minutes. Do we need to, well, after all that, talking about the worst nuclear accidents in history, do we need to build nuclear, nuclear power stations? Um, well, I don't know. Let's have a look. We're familiar with these graphs, probably. This is the global fossil carbon emissions since the Industrial Revolution how much carbon we're putting, how much carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere from uh, petrol, coal, natural gas, cement production, going up massively uh, following the Industrial Revolution, corresponding increase in global temperatures. We're all familiar with that story. This is world energy use. This is the US Energy uh, Information Administration. This is how many joules of energy we need in the world to do all the things we want to do, like drive cars and, and, and do PowerPoint presentations and all that business. So this is the historical up to the year 2002, um, increasing energy demand. Projected almost another 50% again up to the year, during your lifetimes, and probably doubling of energy demand during your lifetimes. How are we going to square the circle. How, it, how are we going to provide the energy that the world needs without producing more CO2? And the fact is that there's Roman Abramovich. I always put him there because I don't like him. I'm a Leeds, <laughs> I, mean, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm a Leeds United supporter, so um, until we get in a Roman Abramovich, I'm not, I'm not happy. Um, you know, rich, rich, we are, but in this room, we're relative to the rest of the world population, we're rich. And everybody in the world says, well, we want to be rich as well. People in the developing world says, why can't we use as much um, energy as you do? So the question is, how do we reduce our CO2 emissions and at the same time maintain the standard of living we want and improve the standard of living of poor people 
around the world. And almost half the world's population live on less than a pound a day. And this is the problem, the carbon content of fuels, gas, oil, coal, both nuclear and renewables, they, it's not true to say that they're carbon free because they, in order to build a wind farm, in order to build a nuclear power station, you need lots of concrete which produces CO2, but in their use, um, they don't produce any CO2. This is the problem we have specifically in the UK. This is UK electricity mix. So gas, a lot of gas, a lot of coal, about 20 odd, 23% of electricity, at least in 2005, was generated by nuclear. But by 2020, eight of our nuclear power stations will have closed down and we'll only have one left, size well be. So the share of nuclear generated electricity is going to drop to 4%. So the question is, how do we make up that energy gap? Are we willing to put up with a small, and I think it is a small risk, to our own health in order to protect the environment? And I would remind you that the world's worst nuclear accident, as far as we can tell, has had no significant impact on the ecosystem. We, we do more damage doing the things that we do to an ecosystem than a nuclear accident does. Um, so I think we have to think about our perspectives and if we're making a choice for or against nuclear we have to bear in mind that nuclear doesn't do any damage to the environment what it does is pose a risk to our own health but I think it's probably probably a small one but I'm not going to answer the question well I think that's it thank you very much <laughs>